Fortunately for me, I have a great um, product marketing team and a really great product research team. So they do a lot of customer interviews. They do a lot of prospect interviews for us. We do really deep persona research that really helps us to understand um, the pains and the, you know, ins and outs and day to days of the jobs to be done of our personas and what their what their challenges are and what, what are they looking to overcome. Before we jump into today's episode, I'd like to give a quick shout out to the sponsor for this episode, Ahrefs. Ahrefs provides you with an all-in-one SEO toolset that does everything from rank tracking to backlink analysis, keyword research, and technical audits. The best part, you can now use Ahrefs Webmaster Tools for free to identify and prioritize optimization opportunities for your website, see all the keywords that your web pages are ranking for, take a close look at the websites that link back to and refer you in their content, and analyze other websites to find out what drives their rankings. Visit ahrefs.com awt and sign up for free. And now, back to today's episode. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the SaaS SEO Show. I'm your host, George Cassiotis, and today I'm very happy and excited to be joined by Bethany Fagan. Bethany is the head of content marketing at Pandatalk, a company which I assume we all know and has over 15 years of sales and marketing experience. Her favorite marketing activities include crafting new stories, impressing her team with her TikTok videos, and discovering new content distribution channels. Outside of the office, she spends her time reading, trying a new way training or hit workout class, and reacquainting herself with her hometown, with her husband and two French bulldogs, Tatter Talk and Pork chop. Pork chop. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care about anything else. I hope I got the names of the dogs. <laughs> you, got, right. you did a beautiful job, George. Great job. Yes, you did. <laughs> okay. That's great. Uh, Bethany, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, George. I really appreciate you reaching out and I'm thrilled to spend some time with you today. So um, as we do with every guest here at the podcast, uh, the first question would be about you and your background and journey and what has brought you to where you are today? Yeah. Um, so I have been with Panadoc for seven years. I celebrated my my seventh anniversary with Panadoc, which basically makes me a startup dinosaur, I feel like. You know, it's most folks, you know, um get in the startup world, last a couple of years, see a, a few different companies, but I'm very lucky and blessed and fortunate to have been at Panadoc for quite some time. Um, I graduated college with a journalism um, degree and major. Um, I knew I always wanted to write and do some sort of capacity of creative writing work. Um, and luckily HubSpot was born and created an entire content marketing industry for us, right? So, um, and my role has, has evolved a lot um, in the seven years at Panadoc. You know, I started as a partner marketing manager, which was really closely working with our integration partners on co-marketing efforts, um, which then evolved into a traditional content marketing role, you know, owning everything from email to social to, you know, creating content, sales enablement, a whole bunch of things to now managing and, and running a small content team. Um, so it's myself and then four folks on the team currently. Um, and our, our role is, um, you know, again, creating white papers, ebooks, webinars, podcasts, events, um, blog posts, and basically, again, running all of our social channels. So yeah, it's been a, it's been quite a journey. So I opened my laptop in 2023 and I've never heard of the word and, you know, the company name PandaDoc. Can you please uh, share with me in just a few words, a couple of yeah. sentences, what PandaDoc is and what the company does? Yeah, sure. We are the fastest growing document automation um, software platform. So we allow um, our, our sweet spot is small businesses. So those around um, under 200 employees in size, and we really enable our customers to create, send, track, and electronically sign uh, documents of any type. So, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a great way to, uh, to to describe the company and what the company uh, does. Now, the first thing that I would like to ask you, and I would like to kick things off with, with this question, is on your website, you have a blog and you have a library. 
Mm -hmm. And I would like to ask, what is the difference between the two? What goes yeah. to the blog and what goes to the library and why? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so PandaDoc is unique in the sense that um, while I am head of content, I actually don't own SEO at the company, which is very, very interesting and probably um, interesting for your, your listeners to hear, right? Um, so the blog really, its primary primary purpose is to drive organic traffic for us and organic search for us, right? So the blog's number one job is to create pipeline and eyeballs and and from search essentially. Um, the library is is basically to um, one have a, a a place where all of our longer form downloadable content can live. Um, so our eBooks, our white papers, our webinars, um, you know those kind of bigger anchor pieces that kind of need a conversion metric to them. Um, and that's where that's where we typically put that, those pieces of content on our library. So that's the big difference is the, the blog is really meant to drive, you know, those kind of in what I say, a um, like an education type um, role, right? Like we, I think SEO and search is kind of defined by, by three different areas, right? It's inspiration, education, execution, right? So I would say, our, our execution type or our education type content really lives on the blog, whereas like the inspiration and execution type content lives in our library. And that's kind of the, the main difference between the two for us. That's great. And as I was um, telling you before we start recording this episode, I was impressed by the fact that as I was doing research for this episode, I, you know, I expected to, to see kind of like what you see in most SaaS like blogs and you know libraries or whatever but that wasn't the case with pandadoc i was impressed and it was a positive um surprise it was kind of like oh these folks don't do things like you know most as companies this is this is different right yeah 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 absolutely i mean the blog is is meant to be one visually appealing, right? Like we want folks to land on the blog and click into content, explore the content, enjoy the content. Um, but we also really wanted to represent the Panadoc brand in a fun, energetic, engaging way. And I I think our blog really does both um, really really well. So yeah, I think that this approach of separating the two is um, is is a is a is a very good one. And I see several companies. Not exactly that, what I'm about to describe, but and what you do, but they also give a name to this, like yours is just library, but uh, yeah. for example, mix panel, I think they call they they call their blog the signal. Um, okay. Loom, yeah. they call theirs um, trans transcribe or or something like that. And yeah. I like this approach as well. It's kind of like a you know this is a publication, right? As opposed yeah. to, to the blog, which serves a very specific purpose. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think I think the original purveyors of that, right, were when Adobe bought CMO.com, right? So it's like it's kind of interesting to see the evolution of how big brands or even even smaller brands have kind of treated their blog as a as a resource and like a media destination or like a a news journalistic kind of website, right? Um, and I think we've we've definitely toyed with that idea, right? Like how do we rename the blog or anything like that but panadoc blog has suited us just fine and i think we've we've applied that kind of naming principle to other areas of content right like we call it library some people might call it a resource center or something of that right but then we have a podcast right and the podcast isn't called the panadoc podcast it's called the customer engagement lab and again the idea is to name the show something that we want um, our audience to receive value from, right? And the subjects that we discuss on the show are really around how to engage and, and keep your customers, right? And that's kind of what about the sales process is as well. And, and it's our target audience. So it is it is interesting for us to kind of have diversity in those kinds of naming things, but treat our content still as kind of a, a media entertaining education kind of um goal and and that's what we're looking to achieve so yeah speaking of target audience and like coming up with topics and content ideas i mean finding keywords and i don't want to diminish the value of keyword research yeah. or anything like that but finding keywords yeah. may be a bit more straightforward right what yeah. about fresh and relevant content ideas that will go to your library like how how do you usually come up with these content ideas yeah, that's a great question. Um, fortunately for me, I have a great um, product marketing team and a really great product research team. So they do a lot of 
customer interviews. They do a lot of prospect interviews for us. We do really deep persona research that really helps us to understand um, the pains and the, you know, ins and outs and day to days of the jobs to be done of our personas and what their, what their challenges are and what, what are they looking to overcome? So I'd say like, that's probably number one source as we, we, again, we have a dedicated team that really, really helps us to understand and, um, get to know our personas really, really well. Um, the other, there's two other two areas too, that we really look to kind of for inspiration of content. Um, we admire all the big brands out there just as much as you guys do too, right? Like we, we're following Gong, we're following Airmeet, we're following some of these big purveyors of content along with our, our competitors. So we download their content, we look at their content, um, you know, what do we like, what do we not like, what will we do different about it? Um, and then I'd say the third piece is, um, you know, we're, we're fortunate to have 100,000 followers on LinkedIn. We constantly are surveying our audience. We're constantly running polls. We're constantly, um, I just actually launched a, a content survey in our monthly newsletter uh, this week that kind of goes, just gives 10 simple questions. You know, how'd you hear about us? Where do you consume content? Where do you go for content? Um, you know, what do you like about Pandadoc content and what do you want to see more of? So um, those are really, I'd say all three of those areas are really great sources for us to kind of ideate and come up with new new ideas for, for pieces of content. I guess this is a note for Minusia's team to cut this, you know, snippet and share it with our clients so that we kind of like communicate the value of getting closer to your customers and uh, yeah. like uh, maintain maintain a, an open dialogue with them because yes. they are the ultimate source of truth. I mean, yeah, 100%. you know, keyword research software or more recently uh, chat GPT and all these emerging <laughs> right. technologies. Yeah. They can like they can give you data, but they are. It's not like getting on a conversation with like a customer, paying customer, or yeah. even getting on a on a on a like con, on a call with with. I don't know if you do that by the way. Exit kind of interviews or yeah, um, we do. We I have recordings of them. So like again, our our cust our we have a team of researchers who who do exit or like close lost calls. I think is what they call them, right? Where they talk to our prospects who not necessarily became Panadoc customers, but yes, we have, we have like internal researchers, if you will, that, that execute those calls and record them for us. So, yeah. 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 Now you, you have a podcast, you run webinars, yeah. you create yeah. blog content, you yeah. do eBooks, uh, white papers, content for social media. Yes. My question is how do, how do all these different content types contribute to, to growth? given that we shift towards a multi-touch customer lifecycle journey. I mean, is it like kind of obvious to you that, you know what, it seems that people start from like these formats and then they move forward with, with these ones and so on and so forth? Yeah. So I have to be honest, as for a large of an organization as we are, I would say that we haven't nailed like the multi-touch attribution um reporting i think it shouldn't come to a surprise to anyone that it's it's difficult it's cumbersome it takes a lot of time but there have been a couple of things that we've done recently um we've recently redefined our customer journey and kind of remapped what we feel like our ideal customer journey would look like um and kind of recategorized it right so it's discover learn try buy and have really kind of worked on figuring out um, the channels, the marketing channels that we would use in each one of those stages. And then of course, how will we develop assets that speak to those different channels? So for me, the content team really lives in that discover and learn phase, right? So a lot of our um, tactics and the content that we're creating really is to drive um, and uh, drive growth in the sense of our audience growth, right? So we're looking at ways that we can continue to grow our social media channels when it comes to followers. How do we continue to grow engagement? How do we continue to grow clicks off of social media, which we all know is increasingly difficult to, to figure out. Um, and then the other, the other piece is um, that I'm responsible for and that my goals are kind of aligned around is just email, email capture. So how do we continue to create opportunities and create ways for our audience to subscribe to us and to continue to receive our content specifically through their inbox, right? So um, I'm working with, um, our website team to figure out more ways to put email CTAs on the, on the website, right? I work with the SEO team and the blog team to figure out how do we just create a really better 
content experience on the blog that only, you know, not only gets us page views, but also gets us email subscribers as well so that we can continue to nurture them through their inbox. Um, so yeah, it's, and, and of course the, the, the point of the podcast really isn't to generate pipeline or generate any of that kind of stuff, right? It's, it's brand awareness. It's really about how do we grow the PandaDoc brand and grow our audience. So, um, I do have the challenge of, you know, brand attribution, which everybody knows is really, really hard to do, but we're also exploring other ways that we can, um, kind of attribute content to success of and growth of, of dollars essentially for, for PandaDoc, right? So we're looking at things like self-reported attribution and some other areas that we can try to um, capture um, the success of, of content. So, yeah. I think many companies, you know, struggle with, with attribution yes. because I mean, the journey as I see it becomes increasingly multi-touch and how, how can you know what was the first touch and like what led a person get to the point where they will sign up for a free trial or I don't know, become a paying customer or anything like that. Ideally in an ideal world, like, like a person would search for something like, I don't know, product alternatives and they would, sure. you know, get on a page or, um, uh, something with the software, um, like word inside and get to a page and sign up. You can attribute that like specifically to content or um, SEO and so on. But this is not the case. This is not the yeah. case. Yeah, it is, you know, well, it is a focus for us, right? You know, that's why we have the, the blog to do things like if somebody types into proposal software or like DocuSign alternatives or something of that nature, right? We do have a team who is focused on creating content for that. But where we're kind of running out of room, right? Is we know that that can only take us so far, right? It's, it's, we're kind of hitting our ceiling when it comes to inbound leads and pipeline and growth and all these things. So we have to kind of look outside the box of what are other areas of content that we can create to grow the PandaDoc brand and grow brand awareness of PandaDoc, right? And that's through things like the podcast, that's through things like hopefully we'll do, you know, TV ads and some other things that are, of course, cost money but are super hard to attribute dollars to, but we know are necessary investments for us to continue to, to grow, you know, PandaDoc as a company. So it's, we've definitely seen our fair share of kind of growing pains and hitting certain ceilings with kind of the traditional methods of search and things, right? So like, how do we figure out and of areas of investment for us in the, the PandaDoc brand? And that's going to be a big, a big one for us in 2023. So, yeah. How do you balance like your content efforts with those that aim to help you acquire new customers and those that help you activate and retain your existing yeah. customers? So I'd say for us, it's about uh, 70, 30 currently. So 70% of the time is spent around creating content to, to reach prospects, right. And acquire, acquire customers where 30% is about retention and expansion. Um, we do have a customer marketing team that really focuses on adoption, expansion, retention, um, and they work super closely with our um, account managers and CSM team. And um, we work as a content team, work with them to create campaigns um, that kind of speak to our customers and create content around it. Um, but I would say a, a majority of our, our time and our focus is spent on um, that acquiring customers phase, right? So we're we're really focused on integrated marketing campaigns, um, organic social media campaigns, partnering with performance on, you know, how do we, when we create certain pieces of content, what's worthy of, you know, doing ads for video ads or even static ads, display ads, all sorts of those things. So I'd say it's a it's a 70, 30 kind of split balance of, of, you know, from acquisition to, to retention kind of situation. You, you mentioned organic social and, um, I would like to, to, to ask your, your thoughts about that and whether you can share any like learnings that you, that you have, uh, from your journey at PandaDoc, because my, 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 like, as I see it, the, the main, let's say channel and the main, the main vehicle for a company to use a channel like LinkedIn, for example, is through employee advocacy. Mm -hmm. but, and, and there are some other cases, uh, of course, where like the con speaks for itself. But again, it's it's heavily based on the person who shares that. Have you have you noticed anything different or um, by the way, do, do you agree with that? Yeah, or? no, I definitely agree. Yeah, this is definitely something we actually had a discussion on this week for the content team. Um, 
I feel fortunate that we started a podcast a couple of years ago. I really think that um, that has helped us grow our organic social channels. Um, last year in 2022, we saw a 79% growth in our followers across all of our, our social channels. So we hit a hundred thousand followers last year. And I really do think that it was due to our podcast. You know, it's, again, it's a, it's something that is a brand driver for us. And now, you know, with Travis Tyler is the host of the show. So if you guys follow us on LinkedIn, I'm sure you've seen Travis's face everywhere. He loves to push the boundary up until almost pushing it over, but he does a great job of riding that line. Um, and I think what's been really interesting to see is that he's been able to influence other Panadoc employees to be a little more brave and bold when it comes to posting content on LinkedIn. Um, I actually did a, an internal lunch and learn last week within the company where I had a roundtable discussion with um, Tyler King, who is our, our senior manager of social media, organic social. Um, Travis was on, and then we had a couple of other pandas on who um, post frequently on social to kind of talk about how growing your own personal brand on LinkedIn can can aid in just lifting the Panadoc brand too. You know, what's the saying? It's like a rising tide lifts all boats, right? So we really tried to have the discussion around, um, hey, LinkedIn has changed. You know, it is a, a platform and a channel where people have gotten a little more comfortable talking about their successes and failures when it comes to their jobs, their industry, but also sprinkling in a little bit of, of their personal life too, to realize that people have lives outside of work and, you know, want to share those kind of bits and pieces of themselves. So it's been interesting to see LinkedIn kind of make this transformation, right, of, of this kind of play of growing or taking individuals that are a part of a company to grow, you know, a company brand. So yeah, it's very unique. I think that LinkedIn is big. And uh, the biggest thing that it does is that it creates a perception of who you are and like what you do and so on. I mean, many of the things that we experience at Minusia as a, as a company, and of course, by no means uh, I'm comparing here, but uh, on a much smaller scale, the fact that, you know, people reach out to us on, or they like, they, you know, we, we are connected with them on events and so on and so forth is based on the perception we have created about who we are and what we do through, through yep. LinkedIn. Right. So everyone yep. assumes that, oh, like you, you, you guys, you, you do great. Right. Like we see this event and then we saw this case study and, and, and I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's it's similar to how I feel every time I, I go on LinkedIn and I see, you know, mostly success stories because not <laughs> sure. many people share like their struggles and everything. But and I'm like, oh, man, these these guys, they are doing good. Like they something is, is going really well there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think the ones who are even more braver are willing to share the things that don't go well. Right. Like I think there's there always needs to be two sides of the coin. Right. And I, I think that our our uh, employees do a good job of showing the good and the bad. And then, and then opportunities like this to, you know, tell you about, well, Hey, here's what you, what you see on social, right. But here's really what's happening with our content and the things and the struggles that I see day to day, week over week, when it comes to this like industry and challenging and growth and market and all sorts of things. So, yeah. I think the, you know, the kind of the obstacle that m most people in positions similar to yours have when it comes to uh, to to LinkedIn and other social media channels for that matter and where they hit a wall is kind of yeah we know it's, it's important but I can't get I don't know my my CMO my, my CEO to to post there have do you have any any tips around that I, you know my 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 advice is okay don't get them to like write a, a LinkedIn post every day but you yeah. can get them on uh, like a 30 minute, you know, chat with you uh, every yeah. week or every other week, transcribe yeah. that, you know, you yeah. can have four or five LinkedIn posts out of that. I don't know what, like, what your thoughts yeah, are. Yeah, yeah, no, I would, I would agree with that. I think, I think a lot of times people kind of go in with this big ambition, like I'm going to post every day and I'm going to, you know, da, 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 da. I think if you start small, that's when you start to build the momentum and then the rest of it kind of comes, right? I know for me, like, I have just the notes app in my phone. And if an idea comes to me, I jot something down. And thankfully now LinkedIn has a scheduling tool, right? So then I can write a, a thought and schedule it for later. But I think back to your question about how to get leadership involved. 
Um, you know, this is something that I'm still figuring out because, you know, I do have, I am fortunate that, that Makita, our CEO, he has, he is not bashful on social. He loves to, to post of his opinion. And I think that's rightfully so. Um, and, you know, Sergey, our co-founder and CTO does that too. Um, but what I'm really running into now is the rest of the executive team. You know, we at Panadoc, our personas really target a revenue team, right? So I really need like our VP of sales, our, our VP of CS and all these other folks posting uh, regularly on LinkedIn too. So luckily um, our new CRO, Keith Rabkin, he's recently started a blog on Medium, which has really helped him kind of one, get his thoughts out, which I think is really great and gives him fodder for and content for LinkedIn. So it's actually on my Q2 to-do list on how do I, how do I get Keith to help me get buy-in from the rest of the executive team that this is worth the time and dedication to post consistently on LinkedIn. So maybe ask me in, in 90 days, George, and I'll, I'm, I might get back to you and I'll take all the tips too for anybody else out there who, who might have some, some pointers on this. But, okay. But yeah. I might reach out to, to, yeah. to ask going yeah. back to the, I want to go back to the library and it seems to me that one of the main objectives behind the con that you do, and I'm, I, I will focus now on, like content text-based con right blog okay. yeah mm -hmm. is thought leadership okay and yeah. uh, like establish panadoc the panadoc brand as a thought leader in the space right yes. and my question to you would be of course we we can all understand that creating like surveys and uh, broadly what we at minusia broadly refer to and call original content Mm -hmm. It's not as easy and it's not as, you know, scalable, let's say, as content that's created for a search audience. My question would be, especially like even the fact that you have seven years in this role and in this company, how do you manage to, to create um, such content and like do it consistently and whether or not you have tried in the past to do it, for example, with the help of like external, like help, ask for help from a service provider, because one thing that we very often see as an objection, let's say from from you know prospects and 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 even our clients, is the fact that you know what we will handle this like internally, and yeah. you can handle that like these other uh, common types that are let's say uh, not so product focused or mm -hmm. you don't have to give the voice of the customer and so on and so forth. Yeah, so we it's been it's kind of ebbed and flowed, right? So I'd say. So 2016 to like 2018, even 2019, well, 2020, I was consistently creating, you know, that, that written longer form ebook thought leadership content. I think the last longest piece that we did was 2020. And that was when we put out a state of the deals report and then COVID happened. So that didn't really get very far for us, but that was when I had a few more monetary resources to execute research. And we actually leveraged G2 to help us with that. Um, and now we've kind of gotten away from it, right? Because it's, it's, um, we started the podcast, we've been doing morning video, et cetera, et cetera. But I would say within the last year, we've been forced to pick back up um, ebook and kind of this thought leadership written content, because now we have integrated marketing campaigns. And as a part of those integrated campaigns, there has to be some sort of written longer form content for us, one, to get conversions, but two, just to make sure we're maximizing all of our marketing channels. So um, I do have a dedicated content marketing copywriter on my team. Tamira Cole is fabulous. She does great work. Um, and her time really has is split. Um, I'd say now it's like 80-20. It's really around thought leadership, longer form content versus 20% around kind of like product launches and product marketing type content to help support the product marketing team. So um, we've been trying to be resourceful and a little more creative this year on um, how do we bring our eBooks and some of our downloadable pieces back into the 21st century, right? So um, we don't have a ton of marketing budget around to do um, you know, all of this deep first party research, but there's some simple tools. Um, one we're looking at is called, um, oh my gosh, I, I will think of it in a minute. There is one smaller tool where you can essentially put in some credits and put in, you know, pick your audience, do some surveys and get data within 24 to 48 hours. Winter also really does this. So most people think that winter is just a messaging testing tool. They actually have a, a survey portion of their their work. And I think it's like 1100 bucks to, to 
do 10 questions and get answers within 12 to 48 hours. So there are some super affordable, resourceful tools and things out there. Um, oh, Glimpse is the name of the tool that I'm thinking of that HubSpot uses to execute research on too. So um, there's a lot of affordable options, I think, for a lot of smaller, you know, nimble marketing teams to execute some research on in order to create great content. So for us, it's been inconsistent, but we're getting back to that. Like, how do we be resourceful, but quick, but impactful? And it's through some smaller resources and tools like this that have really helped us um, do that. Do you think that all these leads us to a point where SaaS companies will essentially do content marketing or marketing in general, like media companies? Because I, I, I think of some moves like HubSpot's, you know, HubSpot back in the day when they bought uh, the hassle. And mm -hmm. recently, SEM Rush they bought Backlinko first, and now mm -hmm. they, which is, you know, in my opinion, is a great move. They bought um, Traffic Think Tank Community. Mm -hmm. All these things, you know, so, some moves of of uh, like a few select companies that, if anything, they they saw that they know how to grow. Show me that you know what this is where things are are going right. And another one, Paddle acquiring Profitwell, which had a a very yes. successful media arm, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And all this shows me that you know what, this is where things are going. What are yeah. your thoughts? Yeah, I think they I think we'll continue to see those things, right? Like I think um I think a lot of companies struggle with um creating a, a content marketing team with the production strength, right? Because it's it's something that um is hard to one, find the talent to figure out, remove the roadblocks in, in creating content. So I think a lot of companies that are like, well, if I can just purchase a company that already has it nailed, to me, that's that's actually spending less money and time for the same resources that I need, right? So I think that we'll continue continue to see this kind of acquisition of, of you know, blogs or communities or whatever by bigger companies, because it's it's more of a financially easier investment because somebody's already got it figured out. They don't have to hire someone to build that internally. Um, it already exists. So yeah, that's yeah. a good point. And I mean, SEM Rush after the acquisition of Traffic Think Tank appointed one of the founders of um, um, co-founders of Traffic Think Tank as head of digital assets acquisition. Oh wow! Which, okay. which I think is interesting. Like uh, yeah. it, it says a lot about its its future plans, right? So. Yeah. Uh, that's that's an interesting one. Um, yeah. I would like to shift gears a bit and discuss uh, and discuss uh, customer storytelling. You are an advocate okay. of customer storytelling. Yeah. Can you please explain how you serve the voice of the customer at Pandadog? Yeah. So um, I have to give a shout out too to our our customer marketing team. They really help us with this, right? But um, you know, I kind of mentioned that we have those internal. We have an internal team of. Um, product researchers that we certainly use their efforts to help us understand our customers a little bit more. Um, but then we do have a, a customer marketing team who is constantly um, reading our G2 reviews, our trust pilot reviews, um, even feedback from the support team on tickets and things, right? To kind of um, identify big stories. Um, we also work with the sales team in this and listen to the recordings and all sorts of things too, um, to identify those really kind of, um, amazing customer stories that have overcome big challenges thanks to PandaDoc. Um, and not only do we, cre we create really great video testimonials and video content for it, but again, as I mentioned before, it's, it's a, a simple way for us to ideate and continue to create great content by, just understanding and and being more relatable to our audience as best we can. So yeah, we're trying to inject every little bit that we can in every piece of content that we create. So yeah. Yeah, that that makes sense. Um second to last question as we are, you know, ready to wrap things up. Sure. What do you think the future holds for um on an, like for SaaS companies and specifically for, you know, uh like content marketing teams inside these these companies? Yeah, I think um, I think there's a few things that will stay the same, right? There will be const continue constant change on organic social channels, right? Like there, we I know we're making investments in TikTok. You guys have seen our things, but that could change in the U.S., right? We could be looking at more Instagram Reels or YouTube Shorts. So I think we'll continue to monitor 
you know, the changes on social, I think that's a big one. It's a huge channel for us. Um, and I think there is, um, there's definitely more, um, and we're seeing it now, right, is this kind of self-reported attribution and, again, how to attribute content to um, impact within an organization. Um, I think there will still be questions around it. I think there will still be certain um, opinions about which channels and which levers kind of make the biggest impact. Um, you know, for us, it will continue to be, um, we'll still make more investments in the kind of the digital world, right, podcasts and videos to to grow um, and we'll continue to prove the, the, the value of a, a follower as best we can, as much as we can, right? So I think there's there's still going to be, I think, um, constant conversation about like proving the value of, of what a follower means or like what an email subscriber means until they become, you know, a customer. It's the, the one of the hardest things to, to continue to do. Um, and then I, you know, I don't know. I think there's, I think there we'll still see, um, big investments in brand, right? Like I think we'll still see the the influencer model is coming up, right? People hiring influencers to promote brands. I'm I'm curious to see how that continues to go for some people. Um and um yeah, I think I think it's um it's it's going to be interesting as we continue to want to desire attribution, but then also a need to serve our audience and our audience as we know, sometimes gets away from gated content. They want everything for free. So it's, I think the challenge for content marketers is always like, how do we give our audience what they want, but still making measurable impact is, is, uh, will always continue. So yeah. that's a great way to, to wrap things up. Um, last question I have for you, call to action for our listeners. Where can people find out more and reach out? Yeah. So few areas, pandadoc.com, uh, of course, is our website. Um, on LinkedIn, you can just type in Panda Doc. So make sure that's singular, not docs, but Panda Doc. Um, and then um, the show, wherever you listen to podcasts, is called, again, the Customer Engagement Lab. Um, we're on Spotify, we're on Apple. And then our, our TikTok account is at It's Panda Doc. Um, so follow us there for all of our great, all of our great content. I don't have TikTok, but I think I will check your account because I'm curious to see what you publish there. Um, I've anyway. even done a couple of TikToks myself against my own will, George, but please, please watch them for my own, you know, benefit. But yeah. Okay. Um, I will. Bethany, thank you very much. <laughs> this was very, thank you very much for bringing all this, you know, knowledge and expertise um, and this like very beautiful background that you oh, have. Thank you. Thank and you. Uh, I, you know, um, I may reach out again in the future to ask a, a follow-up conversation. Uh, but thank you very much for doing this. I really appreciate George, it. George, yeah. Thank you so much for your time, George. It was really great speaking with you and reach out anytime. Look forward to connecting with everybody. Thank you. Before you go, I'd like to give a quick shout out to the sponsor for this episode, AHRS. AHRS provides you with an all-in-one SEO toolset that does everything from rank tracking to backlink analysis, keyword research, and technical audits. The best part, you can now use AHRS Webmaster Tools for free to identify and prioritize optimization opportunities for your website, see all the keywords that your web pages are ranking for, take a close look at the websites that link back to and refer you in their content and analyze other websites to find out what drives their rankings. Visit ahrs.com slash awt and sign up for free.